Hello and welcome. I'm Jeunesse Castroguet, VP at Clarius. Thanks for joining us for today's live webinar, Regenerative Medicine, Building POCUS Skills for Safe and Accurate PRP Injections. You're among 2,700 clinicians who registered for this popular session. We're excited to bring you painexam.com founder and renowned pain management expert, Dr. David Rosenblum for this dynamic session. In a moment, Dr. Rosenblum will teach us how to use high resolution wireless ultrasound to improve the accuracy and effectiveness of platelet rich plasma injections by sharing four patient cases recently captured on video. Dr. Rosenblum will describe how and when he uses ultrasound to accurately guide PRP injections to promote tissue repair, reduce inflammation, and relieve pain for his patients. You'll gain the knowledge and skills to expertly guide the precise delivery of PRP into targeted areas of the body. And just before we get started, a housekeeping note, please do use the Q&A icon at any time to ask questions. We'll be addressing questions following the presentation and live scanning session. Let me now introduce you to your host for today's webinar. Shelley Gunther is an experienced sonographer with over 25 years of experience. As clinical manager at Clarius, Shelley is dedicated to providing the highest quality educational content for clinicians looking to add wireless ultrasound to their practice. She delivers practical webinars like today's event and video tutorials for our Clarius classroom, which now features over 500 on-demand video tutorials. Join me now in welcoming Shelley. Thank you so much, Janess. It's great to be back. I'm uh, really looking forward to this webinar. And although Dr. Rosenblum is a bit of a regular at Clarius here, it's my first time hosting him as he dives into a very interesting topic. Now, regenerative medicine is an increasingly popular and rapidly growing field in healthcare and in research. And we're going to see some great examples of how Dr. Rosenblum treats his patients and why they love him so much. Now, before we get underway, I did a search for literature on today's topic, and I was looking for information about how using ultrasound to guide PRP injections is more accurate and effective than performing it blindly or doing landmark guided injections. And I found it really interesting that it's becoming more challenging to find new articles on the topic because most injections it seems are being done with ultrasound, no matter what the specialty. It really is, I guess, a sign of the times. Now I did find this first article and it's a recent review of literature, 75 articles in total, that aims to comprehensively identify the differences in accuracy of intraarticular injections via palpation versus image guidance in the most commonly injected joints in the upper and lower extremities. And they concluded that image guided injections, um, particularly with ultrasound, were shown to be more accurate than those palpation guided intraarticular injections. And they also found that image guidance with ultrasound allows for navigation through soft tissue, distorted anatomy and neurovascular structures, which decreases complication rates. The next paper is a systematic review from the Journal of Arthroscopy, Sports Medicine and Rehab. It included 1,431 patients and 1,315 knees. And the conclusion was that ultrasound guided injections were more accurate compared to blinded knee injections across every anatomical needle site. And finally, this paper from the Journal of Ultrasonography is a review of the literature found that PRP injections for hip osteoarthritis, in particular using ultrasound guidance, may be efficacious in delivering long-term and clinically significant pain reduction and functional improvements in patients. Now, just before I introduce our guests today, I'd like to share a little poll so that we can better understand all of you out there where you're coming from in your ultrasound experience. Now, what do you see as the risks and limitations to blind injections for blind PRP injections? Are you worried about accuracy or imprecise injections? Are you worried about hurting your patients? We'll just give this a couple of more seconds here. Three, two, one. All right. Good. So it looks like most people are worried about the accuracy and the precision of their injections. Um, and I think with that, hitting a vessel or nerve is right up there in, in things that we don't want to do. So this is great. You're going to get some great information here today. Good. So now I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. David Rosenblum. He's joining us from New York, where he's Director of Pain Medicine at Maimonides Medical Center. He's dual board certified in anesthesia and pain medicine, and has a fellowship in interventional pain medicine. 
and he's an extraordinary educator who's always generous with his time whenever we ask him to present cases and his techniques. And today he's going to teach us how point of care ultrasound can improve accuracy and effectiveness of PRP injections. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Shelley, and thank you, Janice. And of course, thanks, Clarice, for the opportunity to teach. So um, you touched on a couple of things that reminded me of back in, I guess, 2007, when I started my pain practice, I asked them to get me an ultrasound for the pain office. And one of the docs here said, what do you need an ultrasound for? Because 99% of pain docs only use fluoroscopy. Well, my lectures for about the first five, six years after that point had to be to prove to people why ultrasound has a benefit in doing brachial plexus injections, nerve blocks, et cetera, for anesthesia purposes or for the office. I don't think I need to convince anyone anymore that ultrasound is useful. And I think there's gonna be less and less studies supporting it because it, it's pretty evident, I think. And, um, and the patients are also coming to expect it. So it's, um, people are telling me that they get shots elsewhere and that could you believe he didn't use an ultrasound? So I think it's, it's becoming the standard of care um, in, in many parts of the world. So let's get right into it. So PRP has really been a game changer for my practice. I originally used this as a last resort. I know the Europeans have been doing this for a lot longer than the physicians in the United States. But basically, um, it took a little bit for me to jump on the bandwagon because I really wanted to make sure that this was just not a way to profit off of our patients, that this was actually a proven tested therapy. And thankfully, it is. I, I'm seeing a lot of benefit um, in, in, in my practice as well as the, the, the research. It's really coming together. And you have a lot of studies supporting P PRP for chronic pain for various conditions. So what is PRP? It's an autologous product that contains a large number of platelets in a small volume of plasma, say a minimum of at least three times, but really the, the better PRP um, products are usually up to eight times the volume you'd see in, uh, in, normal, in normal blood, the concentration, I should say, not the volume. And what we're doing is we're concentrating those platelets to harness their ability to, to heal. PRP has about seven, there's probably more fundamental proteins, platelet-derived growth factors, transforming growth factor beta, uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, epidermal growth factor, adhesive proteins, fibrin, fibronectin, vitronectin. The PDF, PDGF is a glycoprotein emerging from degranulation of platelets at the site of injury, and it activates cell membrane receptors on target cells. And these develop high-energy phosphate bonds, which activate single proteins to initiate specific activity of target cells. What you find is the platelet-derived growth factors in, involved in angiogenesis, myogenesis, macrophage activation. Vascular endothelial growth factor is actually helping promote the formation of new blood vessels to bring blood, fresh blood to that area, as well as uh, there's long-term healing, there's remodeling and regeneration to some extent of bone. You'll hear more and more of intramedullary PRP. People are, are injecting the PRP into bony defects. And it's causing initially an inflammatory process, but then it's, it's actually reducing inflammation. That occurs over the course of months. But initially when you inject the PRP, the cells degranulate really, right, really quickly upon injection. And um, it starts to do its thing within 24 hours, 48 hours, you have full degranulation. And over the next court, so for a few days, you have a lot more going on. So uh, you also have cell growth and uh, it attracts stem cells. So you really have a lot going on when you inject PRP. And there's a lot of evidence to support the use of leukocyte rich PRP injection for lateral epicondylitis and leukocyte poor PRP injection for knee arthritis. Moderate high quality evidence supports use of leukocyte rich PRP for patellar tendinopathy and uh, for plantar fasciitis, uh, for patellar tendon grafts and bone to tendon bone ACL reconstructions. But there's a lot of controversy in the literature still exists. And there's many reasons for this. When, when looking at the studies, um, you'll find that some of them are meta-analyses, which they're using different formulations of PRP. Sometimes the kits are different, the concentrations are different. I don't see many studies that really are giving you the exact platelet counts 
And that's a problem, especially if it's um, if it's a meta-analysis comparing different, you know, with each study uses its own product. Um, and there's, um, you just need to be very wary when you look at a negative study, as well as a positive study, right? We're not looking, we're not trying to convince ourselves this works. We just want pure evidence. And unfortunately, it's not standardized across all of the studies. So just read the fine print when you're looking at the studies. But that being said, there's really very little downside to PRP. So um, there, is a, there is evidence showing a lack of efficacy of PRP for Achilles tendinopathy. Two years ago, a meta-analysis was released saying it didn't work. That being said, I've had patients come to my office with Achilles tendinitis, and they've had steroid injections by other doctors. They've tried medication PT, and nothing else worked. And then I do the PRP, and within two months, they're cured. So I've seen this with my own eyes. Of course, it's anecdotal. So I can't say this is purely evidence-based, but it's such a low risk procedure that, you know, if it was my relative, it was myself, I would definitely do it first, even though there is still some controversy in some of the data for some of the biologic products and target tissues. Um, so PRP, uh, according to the statement, there are some studies going against using it for rotator cuff repair, but there are plenty of studies supporting it for rotator cuff tear. So that's why the insurance companies will tell you it's still controversial. But I do think every year, more and more positive studies are coming out. And if you go to the major pain conferences and you hear the experts in regenerative medicine speak, you'll, 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 he, you'll hear similarly from them what I'm saying, that more and more positive studies are coming up. And yes, there are negative studies, but look at the fine print. So are there side effects? Well, of course, anytime you stick a needle in a patient, there's a risk of infection, bleeding, nerve damage, there's trauma that can occur from the needle stick. You also have, um, you know, you're, you're not usually typically giving any medications with this. We're using maybe local anesthetic for the skin and soft tissue, but we're not mixing local anesthetic with the PRP because it can actually inhibit the effectiveness of the PRP. In addition, you're asking the patients to stay off of NSAIDs and steroids, anti-inflammatories for at least two weeks. The reason is you don't wanna do anything to interfere with platelets or the inflammatory cascade. It's not really dangerous. It's just more, it may not work. And then the patient wastes their time and money. So the side effects can be vasovagal, what you see with any injection. What are the contraindications? Well, metastatic cancer is. Um, some people will not do it with a cancer history. Um, I will not do it with any active cancers. You don't want to put the PRP where there's any infections. Um, although there are some who say that the leukocyte rich PRP may be better for a, a fresh wound where there is the potential for infection because you have those leukocytes. You're not going to give it in pregnancy or breastfeeding. And to be honest, if somebody had a painful inflammatory condition during pregnancy, um, a non-steroid, um, non-radiation-based treatment may be ideal, and PRP could be it, but this is what the data, the literature is saying, not to give it in breastfeeding or pregnant patients, so I'm currently not offering it, nor do I recommend it. Patients who are on anticoagulants need to stop their anticoagulants prior to doing a PRP injection. And I mentioned corticosteroids, NSAIDs, and liver disease. Uh, allergies to any of the products you may use, the anticoagulants in the kits, the lidocaine, bupivacaine, or local anesthetics, of course, are contraindications. So you have leukocyte-rich PRP, which we refer to as LPRP, and there was a higher incidence of side effects in the treatment of osteoarthritis, according to some studies. Some believe there may be more scar tissue formed. Pure PRP lacks the leukocytes, and there are still... Um, lots of um, uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as the interleukins, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha at the site of the injection that can result in a destructive protease inhibits formation and promotes the degradation of the extracellular matrix that could be uh, quite helpful here. So, you know, if you, if you look into the research for PRP, there are tons of studies. I mean, thousands of studies now. Okay, this is just uh, one study with only 16 elite athletes, but I think, I think it's just important to note, they want to evaluate the outcomes of ultrasound-guided injections of PRP into the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament 
the AITFL in athletes and they're monitoring return to play and dynamic stability. The athletes received two injections seven days apart. Now there's no protocol in terms of the duration and how often patients get PRP. There are studies supporting the more injections they get, the better the response. But you know, anyone who's telling you you need a shot every month or every two weeks, it's their own protocol. This is not, as far as I know, not any standardized protocol that, that's across the medical societies. So they, they did this with a control group uh, with no interventions. Both groups had the same rehab course and return to play protocols. The pre-treatment and six-week follow-up ultrasounds were done to assess the dynamic stability of the joint and also the AITFL scarring. Primary measure was time needed for athletes to return to full pre-injury training intensity. They concluded that the athletes suffering from high ankle sprains benefited from the ultrasound guided PRP injections with shorter return to play, restabilization of the syndesmosis joint and less long-term residual pain. This was level two evidence, here's the link. Um, okay, so if you're interested in hands-on learning more about PRP with a lecture slash workshop. I run courses at least one to two per year live. You could Zoom the course. Here's a QR code you could scan, or you could just go to my info at NRAP uh, pain email or nrappain.org and see my course schedule. I have on, online courses for regenerative medicine as well as in-person courses for regenerative medicine. So feel free to check out the QR code and go to the website. Okay, the SI joint. This is a joint that I've actually had quite a bit of success with PRP. It's a lot safer than the steroid shot. And from the data I've read, as well as from my own personal experience, the PRP tends to last longer than the steroid. So I, I tend to offer this for patients who are suffering with sacroiliac joint pain. So if you're not familiar, sacroiliac joint pain is buttock pain. There could be pain radiating down the back of the leg. It can mimic sciatica. It can be related to gait abnormalities, prior lumbar fusion, obesity, lumbar spinal stenosis, pregnancy, leg length discrepancy, and scoliosis. There's no single physical exam maneuver that can make this diagnosis. There's a lot of provocative tests and they're really important, especially for getting authorization for the procedure. These tests include FABER, which is the Patrick's text, that's flexion, abduction, external rotation of the hip, the compression, distraction, thigh thrust, and gains in test, which I'll show you soon. You need at least three out of the five provocative maneuvers to get a tentative diagnosis. And this is according to most insurance plans in the US. Of the three positive tests, either the thigh thrust or compression test should be positive. By performing the provocative maneuvers, there's an 85% pretest probability that an intraarticular injection will be successful. And there was another study that confirmed three or more pain provocation tests have a 91% sensitivity and 78% specificity for SI joint pain. They say the typical way to make the diagnosis is really just stick a needle in the joint under x-ray guidance with contrast, give lidocaine, and get pain relief. That's typically how a pain physician will make this diagnosis. So here's a picture of the favor test. Okay. The side being tested is the side where the arrow is aiming down. The thigh thrust or posterior shear test is another test where you're putting stress on the sacroiliac joint. Remember, they're putting contralateral pressure on the other side there, as with the Gainsland's test, which they're doing extension of the, the pelvis on the ipsilateral side while the contralateral side is in flexion and stabilized. Here's a picture of the compression test. And I, and I must tell you, when you're doing this, you're pressing on the iliac uh, rim, the ASIS sort of uh, lateral iliac crest. Do not pre press on the greater trochanter because of many patients will have coexisting greater trochanteric arthritis or hip arthritis for that matter, and they'll have a false positive. So make sure you're not pressing on the trochanter. And here's a distraction test. You're basically just pushing the ASIS or ASIS anterior superior iliac spine or the iliac bones down and outward. Okay, here's an image of the SI joint under ultrasound. Notice the iliac bone is superficial. Here's the sacrum. The joint is not really visible. It just, it, it's hidden behind the iliac bone. So a lot of physicians used to do this injection blind and it's not such a hard thing to do blind. 
sometimes under x-ray actually can be quite challenging because the, the joint varies in orientation and shape amongst many people. There's also, with the, with the SI joint, the problem isn't always arthritis of the joint. It could be ligaments covering the joint, and there are a lot of them. So you want to, you know, sometimes get the needle in the joint, but it's not so bad to also inject outside the joint. You'll probably wind up helping the patient. So here I'm numbing up a patient for the SI joint. Now I'm not putting the local anesthetic into the joint because I don't want it to interfere with the PRP. Many times I will get my needle tip on the sacrum outside or lateral to the sacral foramina to give the lidocaine because that's where the lateral sacral branches run posterior to innervate the SI joint. Here I'm finding the SI joint, here's the iliac bone, here's the sacrum. S1 frame is in and out of view. Sometimes you'll see it here, the, the lap, the, 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 the bony gap that may occur, like right there, there you go. And here's my needle coming in and I'm trying to get posterior to that, to that, to that uh, iliac bone. And it's a characteristic pop as you pop into the joint. You'll, it's more by feel at this point. But to give the PRP in the joint is sometimes equally important, important as to giving it outside of the joint because there can be also ligament damages uh, or a strain with patients suffering from SI joint. Apologize, my needle is coming in and out of view here. And the tip, you can't really see well because it's inside the joint. And I'm injecting about three mLs of, of uh, PRP. There is a little red tinge to the PRP. I probably had a little bit of red blood cells in there. With the way I smell my PRP in the kit, I sometimes prefer to get a little extra blood cells in there as opposed to miss out, missing out on some platelets. The most important thing is to get those platelets out. Okay, now I'm finding the patient's greater trochanteric bursa. She also had coexisting bursitis, which is quite com uh, common commonly coexisting. And here is the greater trochanter, this bone right here. I'm coming in posteriorly through the musculature to get towards the extensor and gluteus medius tendons, which are coexistingly inflamed with bursitis. In many cases, the bursa is typically right on top of the bone and the gluteus medius is the tendon right on top of the bone here. Here I'm injecting about, it looks like 1.5 mLs of volume. And I, I divided up with this patient. She had, I think, bilateral uh, pain, um, and I gave some of it into the SI joint as well as into the bursa. I typically will spin out six mLs of the PRP after withdrawing 60 milliliters of blood. Now, every kid is different, of course. So, Dr. Rosenblum, with the, with the SI joint injection, um, you mentioned that you sometimes inject outside the joint as well. Is that kind of patient dependent, like depending on their symptoms or do you just routinely do that? It will, it, it depends on the symptoms, but there's really very little downside to doing it. There are a lot of nerves. If you're giving local anesthetic, especially forget the PRP. If you're doing a local anesthetic and steroid injection, giving local anesthetic outside that joint will anesthetize the ligaments as well as possibly the sacral, lateral sacral branches to the joint and maybe even the cluneal nerves which it's just bonus. You might just give the patient a lot more relief. Um, there is an impingement of the middle cluneal nerve, which can occur at S2, often in pregnant women. And this can refer to the SI joint. It's not really an SI joint arthritis, but it's, it's usually a nerve impingement, which often gets misdiagnosed. And um, so I, I'm very rarely a stickler for having to be only inside the joint and just a joint. Sometimes being outside the joint may be in the patient's best interest. Thanks. Sure. So what, what is GT bursitis or greater trochanteric bursitis, also known as the um, hip bursitis, abductor tendon pathology, external, external coxa saltans, which I've never used that term, but found it in the literature. Anyway, um, it's a common cause of lateral hip pain and tenderness. About two in a thousand adults, I feel like it's way more common. I, well, that's in primary care settings. In a pain management office setting, it's probably more like 50 in a thousand adults. I see it a lot. Um, it, it occurs in all age groups, most commonly affects patients during their fourth to sixth decade of life with a female to male predominance of two to three to one. So it's over two to one. You can see it with increased age, obesity, osteoarthritis of the hip, knee, and I'll just throw in SI joint low back pain, leg length discrepancy, I'll even say fail back surgery. Anyone who has pain and altered body mechanics is at risk for this. 
So here's what it looks like to image the bursa region right here. And you see the gluteus medius tendon, it would be coming more from above down and the muscle musculature typically tapers into a hyperdense tendon with the bursa kind of like a thin black line underneath it. Uh, other targets, the shoulder, a great tar target for PRP. And here is the glenohumeral joint. Okay, so the coracoid process is right here. This is the humerus, it's a cross section of the humerus and the joint itself is hidden here between the humerus and the glenoid, which is behind the coracoid here or underneath and behind. And this is the uh, biceps tendon right here. Here's my position for the ultrasound. Many times I will go out of plane, meaning I am going perpendicular to the beam and you may only see a dot or tissue distortions. Here is the posterior approach. Okay, actually I did this today. I had a patient with glenoid, I'm sorry, labral tear, and I gave him the PRP from behind into the joint. I went out of plane. You can go in plane with an angle like this going parallel to the curve of the humerus, but sometimes out of plane is easier. And in this case, I wanted to make sure I got into the labrum as well as into the joint. I don't typically inject into soft tissue. I'm usually injecting into compartments. However, some do do that. So some people are injecting into, into um, I guess, soft or even hard tissue, like I mentioned earlier, bone. Here is a biceps tendonitis. Okay, the needle is here, but before I injected, there's fluid around the biceps tendon. That is abnormal. There's a tendonitis here, inflammation of the tendon, and this patient would probably do great with PRP. Here is me scanning the biceps muscle. So, so the muscles here, this is the body of the muscle. I'm just scanning upwards and you see the intramuscular tendon coalescing the fibers to form the extramuscular tendon, which is resting in the bicipital groove right here. By the way, these are subscapularis fibers right here. This is the biceps tendon right there, cross section of that. Here's the groove of the humerus. Subscapularis muscle right there. Okay, that's medial lying on top of the anterior scapula. AC joint, you can see quite clearly here. Sometimes easily viewed, sometimes difficult to do an in-plane injection because your ultrasound probe is so big and the joint is so small. But you can see how the joint, the, the bones come together right here nicely. Here I'm doing a shoulder injection. Here's the biceps tendon in the groove once again. I'm scanning to find the joint space. So this is actually the mirror image of how I'm scanning here. So medial is over here, medial is over here. This is the joint space, okay? This is the glenoid, coracoid may pop into view. In a second, I'm having the patient rotate his arm to expose more of the capsule, which is here. This is cartilage. Black is typically fluid, but here it's cartilage. There may be some fluid there, of course, it's a joint. But I just injected, you see an air distortion, right? Air is I guess, a form of contrast for ultrasound injections. It's not always ideal to inject there, but it sometimes gets in. And that was it. Here's the knee. So I use the ultrasound to find a window between the bones. I don't need an ultrasound to do a knee shot. However, it helps me avoid contacting bone. So it's less painful for the patient. It makes me look like a superstar. And the patients have come to expect it, especially if they're sp spending money on PRP. For the most part, PRP is not approved by most insurance companies in the United States, and therefore patients are paying for it out of pocket. Patella, patella tendon, which by the way, I believe um, the new Claris ultrasounds can actually measure the thickness of the tendons, which could be useful for certain circumstances. So um, here is, I just saw the, the patella, now I'm at the tibia, and this is the inf infrapatella tendon, and you're gonna just see me come in to inject PRP. This patient, she's, um, I think she's 74. She had chronic knee arthritis. She really wasn't a believer in PRP, but she decided she didn't want any more steroids. We did it and she did fantastic. This shot was in April. Her knee is still better. And she's considering doing PRP in her spine now, which I'm doing more and more of. I had a woman in today who told me the PRP shots we did two years ago in her back um, are still holding up. Um, many patients are becoming more and more educated and they're understanding that sometimes what's covered by the insurance and considered standard of care is not always best care. 
and that they're probably better off doing something with less of a risk and more natural, such as PRP. I know we have a bunch of questions. I guess we'll get to them later, so I'm not going to answer you guys just yet, but just um, don't worry, we know about it. Yeah, we'll do that at the end, toward the end of the webinar. Right, so cervical trigger point injections, you have a lot of musculature in the neck, semispinalis, capitis, spinous capitis. Uh, these are the, the muscles that overlie the occipital nerves. Levator scapula is one of the most common uh, trigger points that refers pain down to the scapula when there's a neck issue. And keep in mind, the cervical vertebral bodies look a lot different than the lumbar vertebral bodies. And I, I, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier that I was very skeptical about PRP. I probably did a training course like 10 years ago. And I had a gentleman come to me. He had failed uh, neck surgery syndrome. He had a posterior anterior cervical laminectomies for surgeries. Couldn't do an epidural on him for his neck pain going to his arms. And what happened was um, he failed the medial branch blocks, the trigger points, any steroid shots I could do on the exiting nerve roots as well. And this must have been, like I said, 10 years ago. I said to him, you know, um, there's this thing I learned, PRP. It's not covered by insurance. And I don't really have much evidence at this point in time to support what I'm offering you. However, it's very low risk. I did this. I didn't see him for four years. I thought he was pissed off at me and never came back. Wound up being, um, he came back four years later. The first thing he said to me was, my knee hurts. I said, well, what about the neck? I mean, we spent a year trying to get your neck under control. We did the PRP and I never saw you again. He said, it worked. My neck's way better, thank you. Mm -hmm. The same patient, um, for, well, he made me a believer in PRP. And then with the release of guidelines from ASIP, the major pain societies in the US, with all these studies being published and uh, support for it academically, evidence-based and low risk, it seemed like it made complete sense. So it's becoming almost a first line therapy for many of my patients. Lo and behold, this, this gentleman actually was uh, infected with COVID a few years ago and he wound up getting intubated at my hospital and being on the ventilator for probably two, three weeks stuck in the ICU, not moving much. He wound up getting compression neuropathies of his radial median nerves and suffering tremendously. He's had gained a lot of weight. He had um, uh, chronic nerve pain in his hands. And now we're doing PRP injections on the nerves in his hands. We started this about two months ago and he's had um, two treatments so far and his, his the burning pain is 50% better now. So he's not completely cured, but he's getting better and um, we're gonna do another PRP shot soon for him. There's no protocol on this. There's no set recipe. He's lucky, he has the resources, he can afford this because the insurance doesn't pay for this. Many patients can't afford this and it's very unfortunate. But, um, but yeah, I mean, the, 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 the future is still wide open with this therapy and it doesn't work for everyone. Not every patient you know, responds. So cervical anatomy. Um, when you're injecting in the neck, you need to be wary, of course, of the blood vessels, right? The vertebral arteries right here. This is posterior, anterior is over here. Here's the articular pillar. So you're having the, um, I'm sorry, this is anterior, this is posterior. So the articular pillar, the foraminal space is over here. It's not so clear. This is a nerve root, most likely, of the brachial plexus. If you scan them up, you'll see, you'll follow them as they go right into the, into the, um, into the foramen. Okay, here is a picture where I am injecting trigger points in this patient's neck. She also, if you can see from the scar, she had failed neck surgery syndrome. She has a lot of pain. And um, I am putting the PRP not only in trigger points, but also near the facet joints and medial branch nerves by the articular pillar in the hopes of giving her relief. Um, and you know, there are people injecting PRP and trigger points. There are those who say, why? It's a waste. Um, I've had some success with it. Um, this is one of those cases where many of the treatments I've offered have not worked. Uh, unfortunately, this did not help this patient so much, but, you know, it's, it's something that is less risky than putting a needle in her disc or an epidural in a patient who's had a posterior midline scar like this.
I've been doing a lot of ultrasound work in the neck lately. I've been finding a lot of uh, use to it. I find that many patients will actually respond just as well to a brachial plexus or extra foraminal selective nerve root block when dealing with cervical radiculopathy as they would to a cervical epidural. Cervical epidurals work great, but they're more invasive. They're very close to the spinal cord. The brachial plexus or nerve root blocks can be done safely with ultrasound as long as you make sure you're not near the blood vessels and you know what you're doing. And if you're interested in learning what you're doing, why don't you come to one of my courses? Here's another uh, QR code. If you're interested, I do monthly courses in New York as well as in other places. I also do private courses where I go to different sites and coach docs through their injections, as well as online training. So um, you can check out the calendar and you can get CME credits for the course, as well as CME credits for the online training. And you can actually play with my Claris unit. Now this webinar is not a CME credit webinar. However, if you are interested in claiming CME credits, you could go to the NREP Academy's website some of the credits um, have a processing fee associated with them, um, but you'll see videos on regenerative medicine and more information. There's, there's content on the Claris ultrasounds, which will, um, um, the, which will educate you more and you, you can see a lot of uh, what we're doing in the pain office. So if you're interested in claiming a credit, just scan the QR code. Shelly, um, I think it's your turn. Yeah, thank you so much. That was so great. And it's encouraging to hear the success stories and how this is really becoming, uh, you know, more and more common. And hopefully someday, maybe the insurance companies will cover it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. you know what? I've had a few reimbursed patients, but um, it's inconsistent. So I think it's going to happen because it's safe and effective care. And it's constantly evolving. There's always something new out there along the lines yeah. of medicine that's uh, probably going to be useful and safe. Great. I have a model that I'm going to scan for you. So now Dr. Rosenblum was using the L7 scanner, and I'm just going to show you that here. So it's a linear array scanner. And so the image that you get is, you know, directly beneath the scanner. Um, I'm going to show you something just as an alternative, um, no right or wrong, just uh, I'm just going to show you an option here. And this is the C3 scanner. So it's a curvilinear scanner. And the image field is going to be more of a sector shape. And so we'll get a little bit larger field of view. And what I've done is gone in and selected the, um, the hip preset. There's also a hip and thigh or a spine preset. Maybe we'll select hip and thigh and we'll head on in and, uh, and look for this SI joint. Now, the other thing I'm gonna do, and I think you saw this in some of Dr. Rosenblum's um, videos where he was using something called voice controls. And what we can do is we can adjust the image on the screen just using our voice so that we, you know, if we're doing procedures, we don't need another set of hands. So what I can do is say, um, uh, decrease depth, decrease depth. All right. So I'm directly midline here. And so I'm just going to scan out laterally and a little bit here and look for that SI joint. And so here's the iliac bone and then the sacrum is down in this area. And I believe Dr. Rosenblum that I'm seeing the SI joint right here. That's correct. I mean, it's okay. the shadow. It's like this, it's an amorphous shadow. It's not really like yeah. uh, the other joints like the knee because everything is blocked by that bone. Right, right. So I'm just gonna increase my gain there we go. It heard me. By the way, that's a sacral foramen, most likely. The gap oh, in the right, bone. right uh, here. Yeah, I believe that is. Where, if you go yeah, medial, yeah. Your, spine, your spine of this of the um, sacrum should be that that superficial bone. I, I don't think you can see my pointer, but um, if that looks like it's somewhere yeah. between the spine of the scapula and the iliac bone, that's most likely yeah. a sacral foramen that gap. Okay, great. Excellent. Okay. So what I'll do next is I'm going to get my patient to flip over and we'll show the, um, the hip joint. I'll change my preset just to the hip joint, just optimizes it just a little bit uh, better for, for imaging the hip joint. And same thing. So with the linear scanner, you just get a, you get a smaller field of view. It might be a little bit higher resolution, but with this, I like because we can see such a, such a large field of view. Um, 
Now, now we're seeing the head of the femur here and the neck. And we can see the joint capsule here. And then if I go up just a little bit higher, I'm getting the labrum right here. It's a great view. So it's a really nice um, way to, you know, you can see your needle coming from a long ways. <laughs> Get right. a nice long trajectory. A, a point here. Um, when yeah. it comes to the hip injection, you're injecting into the capsule. You don't need to be all the way on the top where the bones come into contact the uh, the acetabulum and the femoral head. You don't need Here. to be there. Unless if you're targeting the labrum, I would go there. However, okay. um, or you could look at the labrum kind of from um, doing a more, um, I guess, yeah, like that, that type okay. of view. Uh, but really, um, you just need to be in the capsule, which starts actually on the neck of the of the femur, close to the close to the head. So anywhere you land on that head above your uh, marker is is fair game. It should spread throughout the capsule. Yep, right okay. there. Yeah, exactly. Great. And that's the hill in the valley you're looking for. Okay, excellent. All right, now we can freeze our image. I can say capture image at this point and the system will capture an image for me. Did it twice because I said it twice. <laughs> I want to Very obedient. OS tendon inserting on the lesser trochanter. You see that right above it? Um, yes. Yeah. Psoas muscle or iliac psoas insertion point. Right in here. Yep. All right. Good. Now I've just um, I'm going to just show you something else, and this is something else that Dr. Rosenblum alluded to. I'm going to change over scanners to my uh, L15, which is a linear scanner and it has a nice field of view for MSK imaging. And I'm going to show you the, uh, the artificial intelligence that, uh, that we've built now into, into the MSK presets. Now I'm in the knee preset here as we're connecting. And as soon as we connect here, I'll get a nice image of the um, patellar tendon. Right, here we go. I'm scanning upside down, decreased depth compared to what I'm used to, just so that I can show everybody where I'm scanning. All right, and then what I will do is there is a little AI icon at the side of the screen. I'm gonna tap on that and tell it that we want it to recognize tendons. And you can see this nice bright overlay that highlights the tendon. And I can increase the opacity of that just to make it a little more clear, which is really nice when you're learning the anatomy and learning ultrasound anatomy and you're not sure what the borders of the tendon are, this, this, this does the work for you. And then when I freeze the image, the AI will place calipers over the thickest part of the tendon. And then we can capture the image from there. And it actually labels it as well um, as the patellar tendon. Now this works as well for Achilles tendon and plantar fascia. So, you know, for, like I said, for people who are learning, it's, it's just a great new tool that we have um, to help learners. You can always turn this off as well. Now that you're familiar with where the tendon is. Excellent. Good, so I will head back to my chair and uh, just hand things back to Janice. Thanks, Shelley, for the fabulous live demonstration. It was great to see the C3 in action, which has the wider field of view and also deeper imaging to 40 centimeters. It was also exciting to see the MSK AI with the superior imaging of the L15. And thank you, Dr. Rosenblum. We really appreciate you working with us on this POCUS for regenerative medicine session on how to ensure highly accurate and precise PRP injections by sharing your expert ultrasound guided techniques with us. Before we open up the floor to live questions, here's a quick poll. We'd love to help everyone continue their journey in bringing handheld ultrasound guidance to their practice. Please complete this poll to let us know if we can provide further information. Do click on as many options as apply. Pricing and availability varies by region, and we have pain management experts from all over the world joining us here today, so feel free to request a quote and pricing. You may opt to speak to one of our experts about the advantages of wireless ultrasound. If you'd like to discuss scanner features, please select that option. You can also book a virtual one-on-one -on -one demo with our experts to see the new Claris HD3 in action in a highly interactive session and to determine 
which scanner is right for your practice. And we can send you more video tutorials on ultrasound guided injections featuring doctors like Dr. Rosenblum. Please go ahead and select as many options as you wish. While you complete this live poll, I'll take a minute to introduce you to the Claris HD3, the world's only third generation line of portable ultrasound scanners, now 30% smaller and more affordable. Claris HD3 delivers best in class ultrasound for pain management with an easy to use app powered by artificial intelligence and connected to the cloud. Our Claris high definition scanners are specifically designed to effectively diagnose MSK injuries and guide pain procedures with superior anatomy and needle imaging. They deliver several advantages. Claris is unrifled for near field and high resolution imaging in a handheld device. As you saw today, you get clear views of nerves, vascular structures, and other anatomy, and your needle for safe ultrasound guided injections. The secret lies in each scanner being designed with not one or two, but eight beam formers, 192 elements, and artificial intelligence that together deliver the image quality only found in compact based systems but at a fraction of the cost for presenting 85% savings. And with AI replacing complex knobs and buttons, it's as easy to use as your smartphone. Claris is also wireless, freeing up space with zero footprint for ultra portability in a variety of settings. You get free movement with no wires getting in the way and touching your sterile prep area. With no wires, Claris is also so much faster to clean, disinfect, or fully encase in a sterile bag. Only Claris delivers wireless, scanners with an ecosystem that includes a free app for your iOS and Android devices for unlimited users. Available with our membership, Claris Cloud is used to easily capture and manage unlimited exams from anywhere. Your membership also includes in-app Claris Classroom videos with experts like Dr. Rosenblum and onboarding with a Claris clinician to build your Claris skills. Clarius Live delivers one-click telemedicine if you'd like to share live scanning with a colleague for a second opinion. And with your membership, you also get our advanced MSK package that includes dedicated presets, voice controls, which you saw in action today for hands-free control. And in the USA, we offer the new FDA approved MSK AI feature that automatically identifies, highlights and measures the thickest section of tendons in the foot, ankle and knee, accelerating ultrasound mastery for new users and expediting diagnosis and treatment for chronic pain and musculoskeletal injuries. I invite you to complete the poll for additional information. If you've already done so, we will get back to you in the coming week. If not, I encourage you to complete the poll. I'd like to now welcome back Dr. Rosenblum and Shelley to answer your questions live. Please use the questions icon in the menu bar to ask your questions of our great clinicians. Shelley, if I could ask you to moderate, please. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Janest. Um, okay, we have a lot of questions here. Some of them are in the same vein, but we'll try and get to as many as we can. And if not, we'll, we'll respond by email. There's been a couple of questions around anticoagulant. Um, how many days do you recommend to stop before the procedure? Basically, ASRA guidelines, like you mentioned. Um, ASRA uh, guidelines, Plavix, yeah. Yeah, Plavix or clopidogrel, seven days. Eliquis, three days or 72 hours. You want it out of your system. Yeah, and th this question uh, uh, regarding local anesthetic, and I'm sure you get asked this all the time, because I, I mean, even I've heard um, questions about this. Um, do you normally mix PRP with local never. anesthetic? Never, ever, never? ever. Yeah, I could give okay. local anesthetic to do, and like today I did a suprascapular nerve block under ultrasound to do a glenohumeral joint PRP injection, but the PRP will never mix with the local anesthetic. Um, at contrast, on the other hand, there's some controversy. I read studies saying it's fine. I read studies saying that it interferes. So those who do use contrast with PRP will typically dilute it quite a bit. For instance, if they're doing intradiscal or some other procedure or epidural where they really want to make sure they're in the proper location. There is one question in, in your experience, can PRP injection help for a jumper's knee? It could. I mean, any sort of inflammation. I mean, I, when you say jumper's knee, I'm, I, I don't really use that term. So I'm assuming you, you have issues with knee arthritis. Um, it's, it, it's been shown to be very helpful for knee problems, for knee pain. Um, there was a question about how does it help pain? Well, it reduces inflammation and it promotes um, regeneration or, or, um, or improvement in the tissue, healing of the damaged tissue. Uh, would you use uh, PRP in combination with hyaluronic acid? 
Not on the same day. I've heard of people doing it on the same day. I, I just like to do everything on its own in case there's a reaction to one. I want to know which one hurt the patient. Or if it does help, I want to know which one helped. Now, PRP can take two to three months to bear its fruits. It really does take that long to work. But I've seen patients where PRP's worked within a week. And I've also seen patients coming with joint effusions and then the PRP within a few days makes the effusion disappear. Right. It was, there was a question kind of related to that. It says, we can, we can repeat it again if there's no improvement and, and how long does it last? But I guess that's just an individual case I by find case. It, I've seen patients last get years out of one shot and I've seen people get on average, I'd say eight months or longer. I've had people say at four months, they need a repeat shot, but typically um, I'm finding eight months duration um, for many people, or at least. Okay. Uh, what about PRP in combination with shockwave therapy? Do you have any experience uh, in that? I, I, I don't personally do shockwave. I believe it's a beneficial thing. Um, there are studies supporting shockwave therapy, so they're, they're both safe and um, ways to you know help with tendonitis or pain. So I, I have no objection to doing them together. I wouldn't do it the same day though, but. All right. Do you need to request MRI prior to any PRP injection procedure? Um, generally speaking, yes, for most body parts. For the knee, maybe an x-ray will be enough if you know it's knee arthritis. Of course, it could be a meniscus or ACL, but it's really that whole compartment. I mean, yes, there are things outside the compartment like the medial collateral ligament, but um, the MRI would be advisable. I mean, definitely when I'm doing shoulders and spines, MRI. Okay. Uh, there's one question. It said, well, I'm not, I don't really understand it, but what's your intake for lumbar, lumbar facet PRP, also intra uh, radicular PRP? Um, yeah, what's my intake? I don't know what they yeah. mean by intake. Yeah, but I, sure. I do perform these procedures. Um, I use low volume for the facets and for the disc. Um, um, and I do the epidural and I find it works quite well. Okay. Let's see what else. Uh, for, for Achilles, and I know that you mentioned that there's not a lot of data for Achilles treatment, but it says rich or poor PRP for Achilles tendon. I tend to use poor for almost everything. Um, I've used rich, but um, for the most part, um, they say the, the leukocyte rich may have more scar tissue associated, but there is evidence showing it works for many problems. So there are some studies comparing them and I don't believe it makes that much of a difference. Okay. Um, there's one person asking about how to obtain the PRP. I don't know if you wanna. It's a, we, we, that, we, we just do a blood draw in the office. We take out 60 milliliters of blood or 30, depending on the kit. And we put an anticoagulant mixed with it to prevent it from, from clotting. And we do a two spin technique where we spin it out twice. And this is what I do at my courses. I go through this, the processing of it. And of course, it varies from which uh, manufacturer of which kit that you use. Some people use PRP with test tubes and it's a cheap way of doing it, but I think it's harder to get the concentrations that we're getting with the kit I use. So um, make sure you purchase a very good system so that you can give your patients the best care. Okay. Uh, do you routinely do nerve blocks for pain relief prior to, to injecting with PRP? Um, as an anesthesiologist, I routinely offer it. I don't always need to do it, but like um, we did a video a few years back. Uh, it was one of the webinars where we did a plantar fascia injection of PRP. I did a tibial nerve block on that patient and it worked great because plantar fascia can be quite painful to inject and they have to walk on it out of the, out of, they have to leave the office so you want them to be able to leave. <laughs> so you do the nerve block and, and it kind of, it helps out quite a bit. Excellent. Um, all right, and could you comment on the current evidence for our REPRP for rotator cuff disorders? There's plenty of evidence for rotator cuff disorders. I mean, go into Google Scholar, type it in, or just do a Medline search. You will get tons of, of studies for it. Um, I've seen it with my own eyes. Uh, it, it works quite well. So um, yeah, I, I think you're gonna find a lot more, a higher percentage of positive studies for that than the uh, Achilles tendon, but you'll find positive and negative for both. Okay. 
checking our time here. Um, have you mixed PRP and exosomes for arthritis? Okay, in the United States, exosomes are frowned upon. The FDA frowns upon them. I do not recommend using them. However, exosomes are what makes the stem cells in the PRP work. So they may be the future. They may be the next best thing. But for now, because of the FDA is concerned that you're going to give somebody mm -hmm. cancer or cause some other problem, which I've yet to see proof they, they will, they are recommending you don't do that. Therefore, I teach about endosomes, but I don't teach people how to inject endosomes or advise doing it. All right. And I think there'll be one last question here. Um, have you ever used uh, PRP in lumbar epidural space? I know of studies at the time. set joints. Yeah. yeah? Okay. All the and time. how much and does a lot it of people help? look at me like, whoa, how do you do that? I'm like, listen, yeah. we're anesthesiologists. We do blood tests <laughs> for people who get headaches from epidurals. So injecting blood into the epidural space is nothing new for us. So to just put the platelets there with low plasma, it's really not a big deal for us. If we could get the needle safely there, and it works pretty well for many patients. Now, if a patient has severe spinal stenosis and it's really a mechanical issue, it's probably not gonna help as much. But for the patient who's inflamed for, as they are, and they, the one who would respond to the epidural but just wants a longer duration of response, it's probably, I'm not saying definitely, it will probably give them a longer term pain relief, less risk than a steroid injection. And let's do one more quick one here. <laughs> Where do you place the injection for plantar fasciitis? I am in the plantar fascia. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, come, I come in anterior to the, to the talus of the, or the heel. And I come in from medial to lateral. I have a great video on YouTube. It's a Claris video on YouTube. So you could just Google my name and plantar fascia and you'll see me use my Claris and do the injection. Um, we, we also do a tibial nerve block that day. So you get to see it all. Awesome. Good. Well, we are at the top of the hour, so I think we will uh, close out the webinar. And uh, I would like to thank everyone for attending. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosenblum. Another great webinar. Right. Lots of great content there. Um, Janesse, um, I'd like to welcome you back as well. Thanks, Shelley. Uh, we've reached the top of the hour. Thank you for all of your questions. There have been dozens. If we didn't get to your question, we'll follow up with you by email in the coming week, and you'll all receive a PDF copy of the slides and a recording of today's live event in the coming days in your inbox. Uh, so do look for that. Thank you, Dr. Rosenblum, for sharing you. all of your best practices, for being so generous with your time and letting us come into your office and film your patients. We've also really enjoyed doing interviews with your patients. They're so happy to have you as their doctor and to be able to have ultrasound guided treatments. A very big thank you to all of you for joining us here today. And thank you for Shelly uh, for hosting today's event. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and keep scanning. And we wanna wish you all a very happy holiday season as well. Thank you. Thanks everyone, bye-bye. Have a good night.